So thank you for sitting down with us. I know that over the years, there have been a lot of Ted Bundy stories. Right. This is your story. Right. You saved all of those photos of your time with Ted as a family. Why did you save them? It's a strange phenomenon. It's like I sometimes can't believe this has really been my life. And I kept those photos of us when we were happier, before we knew what he was capable of. The photos are joyful, much like most people's family's photos. They don't look any different. That's my childhood. Unfortunately, the memories that are attached to those pictures have lost their original emotional content and become something different. I still have a sense of disbelief that this man that I loved and that was seemed to be such a great guy could go out and do such horrific things. It's just so hard to accept. Liz, I'm sure you've asked yourself, why not me? Completely. And I hate to even say this because it makes him sound normal, but I do think he loved us. I heard a story told by one of his attorneys he said Ted told him that he would play games with mice and he would let some of them live and make some of them die. And to me, that's us. We're just these mice that we're allowed to live. There isn't anybody who grew up here that is of a certain age that doesn't have a Ted Bundy story. His presence here is huge. It's such an amazing story that touches on so many things. It is part of the history of the Pacific Northwest. It's part of the history of criminal justice in the United States. It's a story worth telling. Who was this young man in the Pacific Northwest? He knew how to flatter people. He knew how to win their trust. He was good looking and charming and seemingly had the world in his grasp and was going to be a successful guy. There were two Bundys. The only people that ever saw the diabolical Bundy were his victims. I never wanted to think people were born evil, but my opinion about that changed when I met Ted. I think he was just born evil. Seattle was a smaller, more innocent place back then. It was a time when many women were feeling very independent, so people didn't think right away that a woman who hadn't been seen for a few days might have fallen into harm's way. When you look at Ted Bundy, he was about the right age to be in college. He drove a Volkswagen Beetle, a very, very popular car in the 70s. And so when he would move into a college campus. He just fit right in. But he graduated in June of 72 from the University of Washington with a degree in psychology. Why does he get a degree in psychology? From my view, he does that because he wants to be able to continue to manipulate people. One of his activities was to be involved in political campaigns. Governor Dan Evans was brought down to the aisle and given a tumultuous welcome. He worked for the committee to re-elect Dan Evans. He had aspirations. He wanted to go to law school. I mean, he was thought to be sort of a rising star in the Republican Party in Washington State. I think a number of things conspired to make Ted Bundy, Ted Bundy. And when you look at the childhood of serial killers, there are some common themes, and I see them in Ted's case, where there's dysfunction in the family, and what happens is they grow up with a lot of rage, typically towards women. He wanted to be from a family that had money, and he wasn't. This is a guy who, from the earliest age, was a petty thief. Tell me when you first realized he was stealing things. He stole a pair of ski boots from the Student Union building on the University of Washington campus. And he brought them over to my apartment. And he said, if I hadn't have stolen them, somebody else would have. So he just took them. He talks about having been a peeping Tom at some point. And the idea that Ted Bundy was involved in peeping actually makes sense because it's basically a training ground about how you isolate people, how you watch people, how you get into houses. He was a night person. He would get restless, get in his car and drive for great distances. So he was a roamer, always. But a part of
part of him longed to be with somebody or a part of something, part of a family. He had this long-time girlfriend who had a child. I want to go back to when you first arrived in Seattle. You were a single mom. You went out to that bar and you saw a handsome man. Tell me about when you first met Ted Bundy. Well, I was pretty smitten right from the get-go. I saw him sitting at the table and I went over and talked to him because I told him he looked lonely. And, you know, I took him home with me that night, which I wasn't in the habit of doing. Yeah, out of character for you? Yes. She was a young, reasonably naive, single mother from Utah who met the man who was considered by virtually everybody in society and culture in the 1970s as the dream date, the perfect husband material, a prince charming. Is it fair to say, at least at first, that Ted Bundy was a gentleman? Oh, completely. Put a lot of energy into making us happy, doing fun things. My parents loved him. He was just really it, in my opinion. And I really wanted to marry him. Give me some of the activities that you all would do as a family together. So he had a favorite everything, a favorite restaurant, a favorite carpet store. <laughs> it's just, so he wanted to take us to all the places that he thought were cool. Went to the zoo, went to all the fun kids' things. He always seemed to embrace us as a family unit. When he was with Liz, he, he said he really enjoyed uh, being a family man. He said the things that... You know, I would expect my brother to say about his family. But as the years rolled on, he determined that, no, I'm never going to be married. I'm never going to have children. I'm never going to be a governor. I'm never even going to be an attorney. I'm just going to murder. And this is what makes 1974 so extremely different. He determined he's going to launch himself into full-time murder. And he's just going to keep doing it until he was captured or killed. You've written about how things did actually get disturbing, but at the time, the age you were at, it was mostly just confusing. Yeah, it was confusing. And you didn't tell your mom? No. He had become naked during the course of a game of hide-and-go-seek, and I was very confused by that. You said his eyes changed? His eyes changed, and I got a real sense of direction at that moment of looking into his eyes with him there naked that this was extremely dangerous and bad can you describe to me what your relationship was like in 1974 well it had changed you know we got together in the fall of 69 so we'd been together several years and things changed in that he would start walking home late at night rather than spending the night at my house um just subtle changes where i felt like maybe i was losing him you thought maybe worst case scenario He's seeing someone else. Yes. Never in my dreams did I think he was out stalking women and then eventually abducting and murdering women. Linda Ann Healy was a very popular young woman because she was on the radio five days a week at 7 o'clock in the morning. She gave the ski report. In all of my years of studying murder, I've never heard of an abduction quite like the Linda Ann Healy abduction. I was one of many who listened to her in the morning, and I realized the day that she wasn't on the air that there was something unusual. She never showed up for work. Bundy used to frequent a bar, Dante's Tavern. On the last night of her life, Linda Ann Healy went to Dante's with another girl and a friend of theirs. Bundy probably did follow them home and waited, and he checked the front door, and it was unlocked. This is what makes this abduction so incredibly surreal. He goes down in the basement, enters Healy's room. He's aware that there's another bedroom on the other side. He would tell a writer later that he choked her. He moves her off the bed. He takes her nightie off of her, hangs it up in the closet, and he makes the bed almost like in a military fashion. And he carries her into the night. He takes her down the front steps, and they're steep steps, to wherever his car is parked and puts her in there. He would turn the passenger seat around so it was flat. And I asked him why he did that once. He said, well, because that's the way he put his cargo in, in the car. How's that for disgusting? 
once he got girls to the destination, he raped them, he bludgeoned them, he molested their bodies. And from there the nightmare began. That Donna Manson, she disappeared from Evergreen State College. And then you have the abduction of Susan Rancourt from Central Washington. Susan Rancourt in Ellensburg was on her way to a meeting to see about being a dorm counselor. In May of 1974, Roberta Kathleen Parks went missing. And in those days, it was reported just as a missing student. And these young women started disappearing, and people wondered what's going on here. And then Brenda Ball was abducted near the Flame Tavern. She wasn't a college student. That made it all the more challenging because it, it adds to the randomness of the victims. He took his victims from where he could fit in. I mean, he fit in great. This is the psychological factor. You don't think a killer of women is going to be a good-looking, articulate young man. You're not thinking in terms like that. George Ann Hawkins was a student at the University of Washington. George Ann was abducted in June of 1974. She disappeared from an alley one night behind Greek Room. Being a university district, people are walking around all, all hours. She went down the alley. There was Bundy. He was moving up the alley using a, uh, a briefcase and some crutches. And a young woman walked down. I saw, I saw her round the, the north end of the block into the alley and stop for a moment and then keep on walking down the alley toward me. And about halfway down the block, I encountered her and asked her to help me carry the briefcase, which she did, and we walked back up the alley. Does he look like a killer? Nah. Does he look like an abductor abductor of women? No. He looks like somebody in need. He's got like a leg cast on his, on his crutches. I went to his room one night and had crutches leaning against the wall by the the door to his room and I asked him what it was because what was that for and he said um that his landlord had hurt himself and was on crutches but he was going to take the crutches back to the rental place so that made sense to me so they weren't his according to him right he had placed a crowbar behind the right rear tire it's a new reach the car what happened was I knocked her unconscious with the crowbar he hit her with such force that she came out of uh, one of her shoes, and both her earrings flew off. There were some handcuffs there, along with the group bar, and uh, they handcuffed her and put her in the passenger side of the car and drove away. They drive to a spot that he's already picked out, going to be off of a main highway. He said, sometimes check the moon out, too, so when, when it's going to be bright, I don't have to leave my headlights on to see what I'm doing. And the speed with which she would have had to have been abducted tells you that probably the person had done this before. We really could not find anything definitive that tied all the victims together. The long and short of it was that, that I again knocked her unconscious and strangled her. Ted loved nighttime because he could be out and but not be seen. But then there's the day where he took two girls in broad daylight. And those abductions would come back to bite Bundy. And the very simple reason is, people saw him. A wave of fear swept all across the state of Washington. Dan Hawkins was last seen Monday evening shortly. When someone was abducting young women. It's hard to tell whether there's any foul play or not. There was incredible pressure on law enforcement to find the person who was responsible for causing these women to go missing. Thank you very much for coming. Anything? What cleverness or what sophistication of the suspect are you looking for that can manage to pull that off? There were no clues whatsoever. I mean, it's kind of remarkable that nobody saw anything, but Lake Sammamish was another story. Lake Sammamish State Park was huge. It was a magnet for all of us, young and old. Like a place you would go to in the Midwest or something with this old-fashioned concession stand and people just coming out with their little sailboats or coming out to sun. July 14, 1974, the place was absolutely packed. There were 40,000 people there. I saw him that morning. He came over. We weren't getting along real well, 
was so surprised that he came in and wanted to know what I was going to do that day. I said I was going to go to a park and lay in the sun. Molly was in Utah, and um, he asked me which park, and I think he was just wanting to know if you're going to Lake Sammamish, then he wouldn't he wouldn't be going that way, he'd go to another park. A number of people that day at Lake Sammamish were taking photos and shooting film. Little did they know the police would want to review this footage. Ted was able to meld into the crowd. He was wearing casual beach type clothing. He was able to strike up conversations with people. He was able to convince Denise Nasland and Janice Ott to help him with the ruse that he had a sailboat, that he had his arm in a, a fake sling. If anybody has seen the silence of the lambs, where the killer had that trying to get that couch into the van and he's got a cast on, that bell came from Ted Bundy. Can I help you with that? Would you? Sure. Bundy was uh, a real schemer. Remember that these abductions were benign on the face of them. They were always Bundy approaching the women in a state of, of presumed need or weakness. Can you help me carry my books, my arms in a sling? Can you help me load my sailboat onto my car? There were three women that saw Janice Hott roll her bicycle up to the beach and lay it down. And she had on a yellow bikini. And then they observed this man walk up to her. And they heard her get up and say, hi, I'm Jan. And he said, I'm Ted. He gave his real name. She was last seen headed toward the parking lot pushing her bike with him walking next to her. And then she's never seen again. We did have about five or six other women come forward that said that they had been approached by the guy with his arm in a sling. And they looked just like Janice Ott and Denise and Aslan. First, Janice went missing, and that was early in, earlier in the morning. She disappeared. And then later, he came back to the park. McCartney, Hale Wings, Junior's Farm, KJR, Seattle, with Kevin O'Brien, 409. That was a Sunday afternoon, and my buddy and I, we noticed off to the side, this guy just a few feet from us, standing in front of the women's bathroom, and he was dressed in nice casual clothes. But the oddest thing about it is he had a cast on his arm. It's 417 KJR Seattle. And Being a couple of smart aleck teenagers, we were thinking maybe razzing the guy a little bit. But it turned out it was our turn to get ice cream. So we, you know, lost track of the guy, didn't think anything more about it. And that's when Denise Naslin was abducted. Those abductions were very brazen. And in front of literally thousands of witnesses, but the witnesses did not know what they were seeing. With regard to Denise Naslin, her car is in the parking lot. Her purse is still there. Her keys to her car are still there. But she's done. She's gone. Who does that? Wasn't satiated with just one. I think he was trying to make a statement that day. It was almost theatrical the way two women disappeared. It, it, it was as if the, the stakes of the story had been raised in this dramatic way. Obviously, it's not until much later that you're able to go back and piece together those abductions and those murders with what you were actually doing with Ted at the time. You went out uh, together shortly thereafter. He called right then. It was pretty early in the evening. I want to say 5.30, but right after... Uh, the woman, the second woman went missing. And did he sound any different? No, not at all. Like as if nothing had happened. Right. So we did. We went out to eat. Just so hard to believe that that's what he was doing. That's heartbreaking. It was also critical that people who were at the park that day, who were taking.
taking photographs of their friends and family. Any filming that they had done turned over their photographs and filmed to us to see if we could find something that would be a clue. The Lake Sammamish abductions would come back to bite Bundy. People saw him and he identified himself as Ted. There's a Ted and he drives a Volkswagen and he's handsome. And from the witnesses that saw him were composite drawings made. When the picture came out, no question in our minds, no question that this was the guy. Each lead has to be followed, every phone call has to be made. Most lead nowhere, some pan out with a speck of information that may someday help clear up the mystery of the whereabouts of Janice Ott and Denise Neslin. commitment. 
kids. So we immediately started to invite him to our social events, parties, dinners. We chatted and had fun and played games. Are you still in daily contact with yeah. Ted as he's in Utah? Yeah, we would talk on the phone a lot. It was just the Ted I knew. Nothing was a miss. It's actually not uncommon for serial killers to have, quote unquote, a normal life while they're violently killing people. Shortly after 7 o'clock on the evening of November the 8th, 1974, Carol DeRange parked a car in this parking lot at the Fashion Mall. Shortly after began what she now calls her personal nightmare. What makes the Carol DeRange abduction so pivotal is that she's the only one who ever got away from Monday. She was approached by a man near Walden's bookstore. This man identified himself as Officer Roslin. And he said, do you drive a Camaro? And she said, yes. He said, well... My partner is holding the suspect in this individual trying to get into the car. He said they would have to go down to the main Murray Police Department to sign a complaint. Right when I was in the car, I knew I had made a mistake. Suddenly, he just pulled the car over, and it kind of went up on the side of the curb. And that's when I started absolutely freaking out. I remember screaming at him, what are you doing? This isn't the police station. What are you doing? And I could tell he just changed. He stops the car and he attacks her. She knows she's in the fight for her life, and he handcuffs the right wrist. But in the midst of this fight, when she's scratching at him and fighting, she gets the passenger door open and she jumps out of the car. He came out after me, out the passenger side. I remember feeling a crowbar in his hand. He was trying to hit me over the head with a and struggling for a while. And then a car came along. I ran out into the street and just threw open their door and just jumped in on him. An elderly couple drove the ranch to the Murray Police Station. The search for her abductor began. And so this is the first time we have an eyewitness of somebody who survives a Monday attack. Sometimes the urges become such a compulsion that they can't control themselves. And that's when they make mistakes. His compulsion that day was so high, he had to kill somebody. The first one didn't work out. He's now frustrated, and so he goes to find a second victim. The teenager, Debbie Kent. My friend came back from Utah, and she said, I don't want to scare you, but it, it, it's happening down there now. The headlines of the missing women had stopped in Seattle when mm -hmm. Ted left, and they started in Utah, yes. where he was. Yes. What did that feel like? Oh, my God, like the bottom of my world was falling out. It's like it's just too much of a coincidence. So I did call King County Police, and I did meet with the detective. You know, it's one of the hardest things I've ever done. I gave them some pictures of him, and they showed him to the best witness from Lake Sammamish. She pulled his picture out of the stack that the detective had given her. She said, no, he's too old, and put it back in the stack. So you had cleared your conscience, the police have cleared him. I just need to put these fears aside. Mm -hmm. So you didn't trust your own instincts. No, no, I knew him so well. Yeah, and she loved him so much. Everything had been so good, so this was just crazy. I think that Ted's girlfriend was very brave to call us. I think she called us in part out of fear, in part out of public duty, perhaps in part out of protecting herself. She had multiple contacts with the police. They did do some investigation, but it kept coming back. He's not your guy. At the same time, while he's committing new murders in Utah, the cops in the state of Washington are finding bones, and those bones are ultimately going to come back to haunt him. The heat is building up on him. Ted starts looking for a new killing field, Colorado. It's the winter of 1975, and Ted Bundy's got to find a place where there's not a lot of talk about missing women and where he can blend in. So he ends up in Aspen. He was very familiar with ski resorts in Colorado already. He understood that uh, those places are populated by basically strangers. On January 12th, 1975, Karen Campbell disappeared from the Wildwood Inn. 36 days later, her nude body was found almost three miles away. Two months later, he heads over to Vail and ends up killing 26-year-old ski instructor Julie Cunningham. 
he was just not going to stop. He had more relationships with dead women by now than living women. It was all about the hunt. Bundy goes on this killing spree, and he kills three women. A 24-year-old, a 15-year-old, and a 12-year-old. In the summer of 1975, Bundy's luck is changing. He was going from being the hunter to being the hunted. In Granger, Utah, it's a small suburb. It was like 2 o'clock in the morning. A cop was just getting off duty. His name was Bob Hayward. And he saw this Volkswagen parked in front of a house. He knew there were two young women living there. And I turned that corner, whop, and I kicked the brick. My light's on bright. I stepped on the gas, and uh, he squirted. He freaks Bundy out, okay? He, he takes off. Big mistake. So there was a chase. He pulled in the old gas station and stopped. I pulled my Magnum out right there. When Hayward comes up to the car, he sees that the seat is out. And that's quite a space. You could stick a body in it. Do you mind if I look through your car? In his car, he had what we would call burglary tools. The ski mask, pantyhose with the eyes cut out. He had a pair of handcuffs. This is what do you use handcuffs for? I'm a law student. He said I use them in my classes. And we took him in and booked him. I said there's something wrong with this guy. That put him on the radar of Utah law enforcement, and they had this unsolved abduction of Carol Durange. I got a call, and it was Ted. He says I've been arrested. Well, Ted, what were you arrested for? Oh, they think I'm the Ted murderer. And he laughed, and I laughed. Well, I didn't think he was at all guilty. At one point, police did show you a photo of the items they found in Ted's car. How could he have possibly explained that away to you? And he tried to just brush it off. Well, you know, I need the crowbar for if I get in a wreck. I need to pry cars apart. I need the ski mask for when I'm shoveling snow. Carol Durange came to the police station, was shown a lineup, and was able to identify Bundy as the person who attacked her. He was arrested and charged with the kidnapping of Carol Durange. He was a likable guy, and if he could be a killer, well, who else might be? So people just didn't want to believe it. I helped raise money to bail him out of jail. Everybody in the ward felt he was innocent. While he was on bail, he came back, correct? Mm -hmm. What was that time like? Well, when he first showed up at my door unannounced, I was taken aback. But we started talking again. This is like, it's just Ted. She was always kind of playing this dance around what her gut instinct was telling her and what the world around her was saying about the possibility of this perfect male person doing these terribly violent things. There was like a fleet of police cars undercover that would follow he and my mom if they went anywhere. And because of our placement in his world is the only reason that we're still alive, I'm quite certain, because people had their eyes on it. Did that thought ever cross your mind? That he was gonna kill us? Oh, no. Did you think he was capable of murder? No. I mean, I still believed he was innocent at that point. During court proceedings in Utah, Bundy actually comes outside and talks to the media. You want to uh, get involved in the criminal justice system? Well, <laughs> yes, I intend to complete my legal education and become a lawyer and uh, be a damn good lawyer. Ted testified and was the worst witness in the world. He was an arrogant basically. And that's the way he came across on the stand. At the trial, Durant picked out Bundy as her abductor. Ted thought he could lie about everything and get away with it. It was pretty hard to explain why you drive around with an ice pick and a pantyhose mask. Most of us don't have that in our cars. Ted Bundy was convicted with kidnapping Carol Durant. Even after he 
was convicted. Uh -huh. You thought it was a travesty of justice. You thought he was innocent. I did, and I started to think that my contacts with the police had set this all in motion. So you actually felt guilty? I did. So after Ted was convicted, I absolutely still thought he was innocent and visited him in prison. There were still many people who thought that he'd been railroaded, who thought that he was innocent, who thought that he couldn't have done it. Police officers from Utah, Washington State, and Colorado get together, share notes, and determine that they're all talking about the same guy. Everybody knew he was their man. It was just a case of proving it. But he's playing the escape. Was that the moment that you knew the man you loved was a serial killer? And not just any serial killer, Ted Bundy. I don't think anybody doubts that I've done some bad things. So the question is why? Can you imagine this woman and her young child spent more than five years with him and somehow they survived? Decades later, they're speaking out on television for the very first time. Did he love you? It could have been love. It could have been just another manipulation. At the center of the Ted Bundy story is the idea that you could have sat next to him and yet had no idea of what he was up to. When you saw the Florida murders, did you think it could be Ted? Mm -hmm. Oh, my heart just dropped. We're just these mice that were allowed to live. Ted Bundy, a Washington state resident, was convicted last year of the kidnap assault of a young woman from Salt Lake City. After Bundy's convicted of the kidnapping of Harold Durange, Detectives have found evidence linking him to the murder of Karen Campbell. On January 12, 1975, Karen Campbell disappeared from the Wildwood Inn. Heirs in his Volkswagen bug were of victims from Colorado in Utah. And that gave them enough evidence to file on him in Colorado with a first-degree murder and kidnapping charge. They transferred him to Colorado to stand trial for the murder of Karen Campbell, and they took him to the jail in Aspen. At that point, Ted Bundy had become pretty big news. I called the sheriff. I asked him if I could speak with Ted Bundy. We sat in this narrow cell and uh, did the interview. You are not guilty. I'm not guilty. <laughs> does, that, does that include the time I stole a comic book when I was five years old? <laughs> I am not guilty of the charges which have been filed against me. He has such a pleasant, thoughtful, calm demeanor. I wasn't at all convinced that he was guilty. He's the most pleasant killer I've ever interviewed. No man is truly innocent. Uh, I mean, we all have transgressed in some way in our lives. I've been uh, impolite, and uh, there are things I regret having done in my life. Um, but nothing like the, the things I think that you're referring to. I asked him if his situation made him angry, and he said yes. I don't like being locked up for something I didn't do, and I don't like my liberty taken away, and I don't like being treated like an animal, and I don't like, like people walking around and ogling me like I'm some sort of weirdo, because I'm not. You think about getting out of here? Well, <laughs> well, uh, legally, sure. <laughs> My class is graduating in about a month. Uh, in law school. Uh, I'll, I'll bet you I'm more about law than any of them. He was assisting in his own defense, so he had a right to go use the law library. This is an old, old courthouse. The law library was up on the top floor. The judge decreed that he didn't have to wear shackles or handcuffs, so he walked about the courtroom and back into the law library as a free man. Over the months, I'd noticed a number of opportunities to just walk right out. I thought a great deal about escape, and I didn't know if I had the guts to do it, quite frankly. There's a picture of him coming into the building that morning, and he's got a really concentrated look on his face. He had dressed with an extra layer. He had a sweater under the one he was wearing on the outside, so he was planning to go that day. The guard went outside for a smoke. The windows were open, and the fresh air was blowing through, and the sky was blue. And I said, I'm ready to go, and I walked the window and jumped out. <laughs> Honest to God, I just got sick and tired of being locked up. 
He was gone about 10 minutes before anyone realized he came out and shouted, Bundy escaped. He went up to the mountains in Aspen, and he broke into a cabin. He stayed in the cabin a few days. Bundy said he walked into Aspen, took this car, which was unlocked and had the keys in the ignition. He drives through downtown Aspen in a Cadillac. He was a terrible driver, by the way. And there was a, a patrol car, and they see this car weaving. This is late. He must be a drunk. Well, he wasn't drunk. It was Ted Bundy. Back he goes. How are you doing? Good, how are you? Uh, here. You can see him grinning when he's been captured. He always acted like he pulled one over on, on everybody. He was moved to a facility in Glenwood Springs. Now it's one of the staff photographers at the Seattle Times. I was given a chance to photograph this fellow named Ted. He had shackles on and I could lay on the floor and photograph him in all kinds of different ways. He wanted to be seen. I'm Ted Bundy. Look at me. I'm captured, but in his own mind, I'm not going to be here for long. In the south, there was a grate in the ceiling that was not secured. There was a light fixture that was due to be welded. It had not been welded. When I visited him in Glenwood, I noticed that he had lost a lot of weight. So I say he lost 20 or 25 pounds. I would think this would have come to the attention of the jailers, perhaps. Why is he doing this? He used a bunch of his law books and assembled them along with some pillows to make it look as if there were a body in the bed. Bundy had succeeded in carving a big enough opening in the ceiling of his cell. He lost so much weight that he was able to wriggle through. He crawled through the ducting, just like in a movie. He came down into the closet in the jailer's apartment, knew the jailer wasn't there. And then he put on civilian clothes. This is astounding stuff. And he gets out into the night and he's free again. They woke up in Glenwood Springs and discovered that Bundy had escaped basically 12 hours before. Did you think it was possible to get out this way? We've eliminated what we felt at that time, any possible escape route from the roof. However, we were wrong. <laughs> These Keystone cops, as the paper would refer to them as, let this guy go again. What's Garfield County doing to find him? We're looking everywhere, uh, trains, buses, and this the usual thing. I have no idea where he is. People should be very careful, should check on their neighbors, make sure their cars are secure. Uh, we're just looking. I couldn't believe anybody let him escape twice. This is bad. Ted Bundy is on the loose, and they have no idea where he is. Once he escaped, he had an opportunity to go somewhere and disappear. But he couldn't even do that. He had to kill again. Bundy's escape bordered on a Houdini escapade through a 12 inch by 12 inch hole in the ceiling. We had Bundy escaped. The detectives said, it's gonna kill again. It's just a matter of time. We don't know where or when. But he will kill again, and we now have to wait. Bundy out the plane to Chicago, took a train to Ann Arbor, stole a car, drove south to Atlanta, and he hopped a trailways bus to Tallahassee. Bundy was an expert thief. Everything that he obtained was either through the stealing of credit cards or cash from wallets or purses, uh, and Bundy was very, very, very good at it. State University in Tallahassee. The campus was generally safe and secure. It was not unusual at three o'clock in the morning to see people walking back and forth across campus because they felt safe. I had joined the sorority Chi Omega. Living at Chi o, my parents felt, was much safer than to live in the dormitory. Being in Chi Omega was a wonderful part of my life. It was just like living with 40 friends. two blocks away from the Kyle Mega house when we heard a call come on the radio, so we drove straight there. As I stepped in, the girls were yelling, upstairs, upstairs, and there was a, a lot of crying. And at the top of the stairs was a girl named Carrie Chandler, 
and she was down on the floor. She was bleeding uh, quite badly from head injuries. Pretty much every bone in my face was broken. My front teeth um, were mostly gone. When I asked her, you know, what had happened, she said there was a loud banging noise. But then she made mention about her roommate, Kathy Kleiner. Her injuries were much more extensive. Her jaw was actually hanging off. I remember then laying on my bed and trying to talk, and I couldn't make any noise because my jaw was broken in three places. I decided to go ahead and start a room-by-room -room search. I knocked on the door for Margaret Bowman's room and didn't get a response. I opened the door, and I went and I pulled the covers back, and I could see she was strangled and beaten about the head. You could tell she was dead. So I stepped across the hallway, and there was another body in the bed. Lisa Levy was beaten severely about the head and body. She also was strangled, and a bite mark was left on her rear buttock. It's so hard to see those girls. I'm so sorry for their families.
I mean, it was done so perfectly that I just believed in my heart that it was a signature. About three weeks after the Chi Omega attacks in Tallahassee, there comes word from Lake City, that's about 90 miles east of Tallahassee, that a junior high school student, Kimberly Leach, has disappeared during the middle of the school day. It was raining, drizzly, very dreary day. I went to our designated spot to meet up, to go to our next class together, and she wasn't there. We knew something was wrong. Kim was not a student to skip class, to leave campus. I mean, we were 12, and she was very shy. There was a firefighter who was coming home, and he saw a man walking across the campus and had Kim by the arm, and uh, he assumed that he was her father. Police are urging anyone with any information about Kimberly Leach to contact them as soon as possible. In Pensacola, a month after the Chi Omega attacks, this, this man is arrested on a traffic stop. The officer made a stop because of the unusual behavior of the Volkswagen. He walked up to the vehicle. But then it crackles over the radio that this is a stolen vehicle. The officer and he have quite an encounter. Well, initially, when I was putting placing the handcuffs on, he kicked my feet down from under me and struck me with uh, a handcuff that had been placed on one wrist. And, of course, knocked me off my feet. And uh, that's when it started. The man fought him. And... Uh... He wound up having pistol with him. He's got this round mark on him right here. That's where he hit him with that pistol barrel straight on. He spends a couple of days stonewalling the police. Who is this man? He refused to give his name to authorities and then told his arresting officer that he would probably get a promotion for nabbing him. Uh, they find out that his uh, driver's license isn't who he is. The car he's driving doesn't belong to him. He's just this mystery guy. Two people who want most to know who he is are Tallahassee Detective Steve Botterford and Don Patchen. I sat there with him and I gave him his rights. And I asked him his name. He said it was Kenneth. And I started saying, where'd you get the VW from? He said, I stole it from FSU. I said, what about all these credit cards? Well, I got them out for people that were next door in the Omega house. The mystery man will be kept behind bars for three more weeks before returning to court to enter a plea. Officials say by then they hope to know who he is. He says to the police, I'll tell you who I am, just let me make a phone call. And he calls his old girlfriend. Well, an undescribed telephone call that you receive. He said that he was in custody. He repeated over and over again that this was really going to be bad when it broke. And I asked him where, and he said Florida. And what did you think when he said Florida? Oh, my heart just dropped, and I said, oh, I was afraid that you were going to be in Florida. I said, I knew, I saw some pictures in the newspaper about some, some tragic murders down there. And um, he said, well, I wish I could talk with you, and nobody listening. And I said, are you trying to tell me you're sick? And he got really mad. He told me that he was sick and that he was consumed by something that he didn't understand and that that, it, that he just couldn't contain it. We called back in the middle of the night just a day or two later. He said, I want to talk about what we were talking about on the phone the other day. And I said, about being sick, and he said, yes. Was that the moment that you knew the man you loved was a serial killer? Yes. That took him telling me himself that he... He had something wrong with him, that he knew that he couldn't be around a certain thing, that he was addicted to something, and he meant young women and causing them harm. It was awful how this man that I loved and that was, seemed to be such a great guy could go out and do such horrific things. It's just so hard to accept. Looking back, obviously hindsight is twenty twenty. Were there any red flags? There'd been one episode in particular right the week before these two women were abducted from Lake Sammamish. We'd been rafting down a very cold river. I was sitting on the edge of the raft and he pushed me in just quite violently. I grabbed a hold of the rope that was dragging behind the raft so that I could get back in, but his eyes were so, they just got really weird looking and it was like he couldn't see me anymore. 
I got back in the raft and I started to just chew, the, chew him out for doing that. And he finally was kind of came back to his body and said, oh, can't you take a joke? I was only kidding. You saw his eyes change. Absolutely. Like another person almost emerged mm -hmm. in that moment. Mm -hmm. Did you feel fear? No, not at the time. I felt... Anger. Anger, yes. In April, about two months after she went missing, Kimberly Diane Leach, her body was found. She had been murdered. Uh, she had been placed in the, the lean-to shed in the hog bin in this wooded area behind the Swan River State Park. You don't understand. Even when you hear the details, you can't comprehend it as being a 12-year-old, and this is your classmate, who was just innocent. The Lake City Grand Jury issued a sealed indictment which presumably names Bundy for the murder of 12-year-old Kimberly Diane Leach. The evidence against him in the Kimberly Leach case ranged from eyewitness testimony, people seeing him grabbing her, fibers, receipts, location, was putting together pieces of a puzzle. We're starting to put all this together and we're tying it up in what appears to be now one bundle. Already two dozen law enforcement agencies have told the Pensacola police that they want to talk with Monday. The walls are clearly closing in on Ted. Okay, you've got the indictment. It's all you're gonna get. Ted Bundy, the master manipulator, makes a move that no one thought was coming. He called a witness and put her on the witness stand and said, will you marry me? She said, yes, I do. The attorneys are thinking, what's going on here? that he did 
not kill Karen Campbell, that he did not commit the ki crimes at Kyomega in Lake City or on Dunwoody Street in Tallahassee. She was a true believer, and she wanted everybody else to have the same conviction that he was not a guilty person. I called Ray Crew of the Florida State University Police Department to kind of set the scene of what uh, he saw whenever he got to the Kyle Mega house. And for some reason, Mr. Bundy decided that he wanted to cross-examine Officer Crew. Good morning, officer. He asked him to describe in detail this horrific crime scene. And can you describe what you saw when you lifted up the covers? As much detail as you can recall. If you need to use your report, please feel free to get some. She was lying basically face down. There was a considerable amount of blood around her head, uh, matted in her hair, on the walls. There was a, a palpable reaction in the courtroom and amongst the jury when he did that. Um, her mouth was open, her eyes were open. There was uh, what appeared to be a nylon stocking netted around her neck. As I was describing her injuries and the blood, his grip on the lectern tightened up and his eyes actually got a little bit larger. I had the distinct impression that he was precariously reliving it and enjoying it. It was so chilling, it was sickening. The week began with the prosecution introducing evidence to prove that Ted Bundy was the man seen by an eyewitness leaving the scene of the crime. That Ted Bundy's hair matched hairs found in a pantyhose mask. That a bite mark left on one of the victims could have been made only by Ted Bundy. The bite mark evidence, it was both new and unorthodox and compelling in the trial. Now this is the verdict, Madam Clerk. The state of Florida versus the Dora Robert Bundy verdict. We the jury by the defendant, the Dora Robert Bundy, as to count two of the indictment, murder in the first degree upon one Margaret Bowman, guilty as charged. Ted's ultimately convicted basically of all the charges. The jury recommends he gets death. The judge gives him death. It is further ordered that on such scheduled date that you be put to death. After the Kyle Omega trial ended and he was convicted in those murders, he was then facing a new trial. The second trial was over the kidnapping and murder of Kimberly Leach, which occurred in Lake City, Florida. The murder I think that you felt most connected to was Bundy's last murder, an abduction of a 12-year-old. Kimberly Leach, because you were 12. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to find words for how devastating it is, the loss of this girl and the things that he did to her. It's really, as you can see, um, been a lifelong source of agony. Thinking about her, her parents, her friends. That someone was capable. That someone of this. took enjoyment in harming a child, murdering and mutilating a child. It was a very compelling circumstantial evidence case, and it did not surprise me at all that the verdict was guilty. Then in the penalty phase, Bundy represented himself, and he called Carol Bundy and put her on the witness stand and had her testify about how much she loved him. And something out of the blue happens. He actually proposes to Carol Boone in front of a camera. Carol, do you want to marry me? time under florida law if you asked someone to marry and the person says yes and there's a notary public there it's a legal marriage i said okay i did it and signed the seal and delivered it and they married her right there in the middle of the penalty phase so now ted bundy is a convicted murderer he's a new husband and he is in effect a dead man walking i don't think anybody knows that I've done some bad things. So the question is what, of course, and when, how, and when, maybe even most importantly, why. I think a lot of people are interested in why. I'd be 
people constantly will ask me why. Ted Bundy's now on death row, and you have a whole range of people who still want to talk to him. We don't understand what makes a person like that click, so we want to try to find, figure that out. Ted Bundy primarily talked to Bob Keppel, a homicide detective from Seattle, and Bill Hegmeyer, an FBI profiler. We were interviewing serial killers, serial rapists. We were looking for understanding and how you or someone like you got away with what you did. And he said, do you think I'm going to say I did anything to you? And I said, no, I don't think so at all. I'm just going to ask you your perceptions on different cases. He then launches into conversations about, quote unquote, helping them with other serial killers. The guy who's killing them, it's like a hobby thing. telling things about what the killer might have done he's actually telling on himself it became clear to me he went back to a lot of his crime scenes he's returning to see the bodies and uh, i imagine whatever drives him to do that whether it's curiosity or a desire to make sure he didn't leave any evidence there or just some kind of thrill he said that place will always be sacred to them particularly if he killed there Ted Bundy is on death row. He's even figured out a way to manipulate the system and possibly father a child. He married Carol Boone. We think the guards allowed them to have an element of privacy to where he could have sexual intercourse with her. There were pictures at the time of Ted Bundy with Carol and a child, and it's clear the photograph was taken on death row. On January 24th at 7 a.m., the death warrant will be in effect. Just a few days before his execution, he decides he's going to start confessing because he felt that if he finally starts doling out information, perhaps the state will keep him alive indefinitely. He became very desperate, and he wanted to offer the authorities something called bones for time. I mean, I'm the only one in possession of this information. That's just the way it is. To do a proper job for everybody, we're gonna need, I'm going to need some time. Bill Hagmeyer was quite successful in getting Bundy to actually confess. You've been involved in uh, how many uh, homicides? We went over this a little bit earlier, and uh, no, we came up with 30. Experts think the number is much higher. Then it could have been well over 100, but we'll never know that. He's talked about, you know, having sex with them while they were unconscious, or having sex with them which is called necrophilia, after they've died. Uh, in a couple of the cases, I'm not sure how many, but uh, you opted to sever the heads from the victims. And uh, how many were that, do you recall? Of the 30? Oh. That's perhaps half a dozen. Now all of a sudden, he wants to tell the truth. For him to be negotiating for his life over the bodies of victims is despicable. You've been after this for 15 years. A couple months is not going to make any difference. You don't negotiate with a murderer. You don't negotiate with a killer. The Florida governor says he's fully confident Bundy will be executed tomorrow morning. It was really a festive atmosphere. There are even Ted Bundy t-shirts for sale. People were cheering, they were singing. Right now, Bundy is meeting with a minister in one of those death row cells behind me. In a few minutes, his head will be shaved as he's prepared for execution.
more than 30 years since that day. And now Liz is talking about the darkness she lived through and how she survived it. And her emotions are still very intense. Have you both been able to love again and trust again? There have been a lot of Ted Bundy specials, documentaries. People have been fascinated with him for more than three decades. And you have been conspicuously absent from all of those projects. Well, we've been approached a lot about participating in various things, but we really didn't want to put more Ted Bundy out into the atmosphere. Now, as a part of their healing process, Liz and Molly have decided to take part in a five-part series called Ted Bundy, Falling for a Killer. It tells the story from the perspective of the women who were directly affected by his crimes. I was very surprised that he was having this meltdown. I know now, in hindsight, what he was talking about. I came to age at the time the crimes came to light. He is metaphorically still the reason I locked my door at night. And I didn't feel the story had been told ever from the perspective of the women. We all know a lot about him. Few people can name any of his victims. When you see those women's names, when you see their faces, what goes through your mind? The world has lost so much. Susan Rancor's mother talks about the fact that she... She loved science, and you just wonder if he, if Ted Bundy hadn't taken her life, what could she have done with that love? The docu-series is so powerful because it makes it clear what our society has lost by this man's actions. At the center of the Ted Bundy story is the idea that you could have sat next to him, that you could have been in a relationship with him, and yet had no idea of what he was up to. I know you've asked yourself this a million times. Why do you think he spared you? Whatever transpired at the beginning of his interaction with my mother put her in a different category. And I think our placement in his life kept us safe. People knew he was involved with us. I feel grateful not to have been harmed when I see what the big picture was here. I don't feel sorry for myself. I actually feel very grateful to be alive and really grateful to have my mom here alive. Liz, I, I think especially for you, I'm sure there's guilt. Guilt about causing this in my daughter's life. Guilt about what he had done. Guilt that I had loved this man that was so gruesome. I quit drinking right after he was convicted in Utah of kidnapping and started a recovery program. And I think if I hadn't have done that, I would have, I, you know, I just didn't feel like I wanted to live anymore. It was just pretty depressing. And, um, but I think that was the start of me re rebuilding my life, but it's taken a lot of time. What can we learn from your story and all those other women's stories? What do you hope people take away from this? I hope that they will see that it's possible to have terrible traumatic experiences and it's possible to rebuild your life. Our process has probably been nothing like the process of the families of these women that were killed. I'm sure it was a million times harder. Being in the room there with Molly and Liz, it's clear even after all these years how raw their emotions still are and how they will never fully escape those memories. So understandable, and your interviews were really powerful, so brave of them to come forward. You can hear much more from these women on the Amazon Prime video series, Ted Bundy, Falling for a Killer, and it's streaming now. That is 2020 for tonight. I'm David Muir. And I'm Amy Robach. Thanks for watching. From all of us here at 2020 and ABC News, good night.